So to make things a little bit fair, I will talk about Phoenix, the web framework, but I'm also going to explore the foundation that Phoenix is built on top of. Uh, just to have a quick show of hand, who here has heard of Phoenix before? All right. And who has not heard of Phoenix, but at least heard about Elixir? I know that Elixir is a thing in type programming language. All right, awesome. So uh, there are three things we need to know we just need to know the words. I'm going to explore all those things. So Phoenix is a web framework that is written in the Elixir programming language and runs on top of the Erlang Virtual Machine. Okay? And the Erlang Virtual Machine, if you, we, I will start with the history behind Phoenix. And it always started with the Erlang Virtual Machine. So for those who are not familiar with the Erlang Virtual Machine, not familiar with Elixir yet, so uh, Erlang, the Virtual Machine, the runtime and everything is uh, was created by Ericsson, which is a tele telecommunication company. And one of the things they were doing at the time, uh, this was about three decades ago, they were building telephone switches. And one of the things that a telephone switch needs to do is to be able to connect person A to talk to person B, right? And what is really interesting about Erlang is that when they were building the language, the runtime, they had uh, all these requirements in mind that are related to telephone switches. So for example, you don't want the telephone switch, right, to be able to, con to connect just one person talk to another. You actually want many people, as possible, talking to each other, okay? So you want to be able to handle those many connections, many people talking at the same time. There are other things, like, for example, uh, sometimes you want to call someone, but that person is already talking to someone else for another switch, so you need to be able to have the switches exchange information so they know, hey, you can't talk to this person because this person is busy right now. And today, uh, the challenges they are uh, working on and solving with Erlang is even more interesting because we have mobility now, right? Our phone is no longer installed in our home, it's in our pockets. So for example, one of the things that uh, they solve with Erlang today inside Ericsson in those telecommunication systems is you are talking to someone on the phone and then as you are in your car, but don't talk and drive, but imagine that you're in the passenger seat, in your car, going somewhere, you are connected to one switch or to an antenna, and then they need to hand off to another antenna because you're closer to that other one. So they built this language, this build, uh, they built this virtual machine and everything for solving a bunch of the use cases. And um, it was restricted to telecommunication. It they were mostly using it at Ericsson for a long period of time until everyone started to realize that this use case here that we have with telephone switches written in your lane and a bunch of connections, it's very similar to the web, okay? So instead of switch, you have a server, and the server can be, is going to receive requests from a bunch of different clients, right? You need to talk to internal endpoints. And then people started to ask themselves, hey, if Erlang was good for telecommunication, it's very likely going to be good for this too. And many companies started doing that. So Amazon and Facebook, they use Erlang. Uh, telecommunication companies like Ericsson and Motorola, they are still using Erlang today. We have companies like, uh, more recent companies like Heroku and Riot. So if you ever deploy an application to Heroku, every time you try to reach your application, it's passing through a routing layer inside Heroku that is written in Erlang. A Riot is a database written in Erlang. Okay. And there is one use case that got a lot of attention um, <coughs> a couple of years ago, two years ago, which is WhatsApp. One of the reasons they got a lot of attention is because they were acquired by Facebook by 19 billions. And WhatsApp is an application that you install on your phone, and then you can exchange messages with your friend. It doesn't matter which device they're using. And what is really nice about WhatsApp is that they use Erlang and they would go to Erlang events and give talk about the infrastructure and how they're uh, handling their uh, traffic and their system. So have an, just so you have an idea, today uh, WhatsApp handle per day more messages than the whole global SMS system per day. That's how big their traffic is today. So you can go and try to find talks or blog posts. And there's this one, which has, at this point, is a little bit old, it's from uh, January of 2012, but they were saying in this blog post that they had 
two million connections on a single machine. So what was happening is that they had two million devices, right, that was connected to a node, a machine in production, and then those devices, they were sending messages, they were receiving messages, and on a single machine, they had um, two million connections. And when you go to see the machine, you can see, well, it, it's, a, it's a good machine, right? It has 24 cores, 96 gigabytes of RAM, but even for with uh, all this capacity in there, when they're handling only two million uh, connections, they're using only 40% of the machine CPU <coughs> resource. Later in talks, they, were, they said that they were able to get to three million and three million and a half connections. So you have an idea. Okay, <coughs> so uh, that's a little bit about Erlang. And I like to talk about WhatsApp because WhatsApp was exactly what led to Phoenix being built. So Chris McCord, so Queen Chris McCord, he's the creator of Phoenix. And he was working on an application that required some real-time components. He needed to uh, send information quick, web real-time, uh, send information to clients quickly to broadcast to a bunch of different clients, collect this information back. And when he heard about this, he said, wouldn't it be amazing if I could use this technology to solve this problem I'm having right now? The tools he was using at the time, they, were, they had really poor performance, and it was hard to work with, it was hard to program. The model to think about the problem he had was really hard. So he, say, he looked at this and said, I want, I want to use this technology to solve this problem I have right now. And Phoenix got started with something called Phoenix Channels. Okay, so what is the idea between Phoenix Channels? So Phoenix, a Phoenix Channel is an open communication channel between a client and a server. And then they are sending and receiving information all the time. Okay, so let's have an idea of how Phoenix channels work. So let's start with some JavaScript code because if we have a communication between the client and the server, you need to write a little bit of code in the client and a little bit of code in the server so you have this information coming and going. <coughs> and one of the most clients we have today it's still the browser, so we need to write JavaScript. So if you want to integrate with Phoenix channels in the browser, this is some simple code that you write. So the first thing we do in the first line there at the top, we create a socket, and then we ask the socket to connect. So at the moment we do this, we are connecting the client to the server, and now we have a bunch of different channels that we can register to. So here we are choosing one channel, which is if we have a chat application, this channel is going to be the lobby. So the lobby is going to be the place where all users are and they can uh, send messages to each other or start a private conversation or something like that. So I can say, well, for the channel lobby here, for the chat lobby, um, every time a new user joins, I want to print on the screen, hey, this new user joined. So every time I receive this event from the server that the new user joined, I want to show that. Uh, every time uh, there is a new message, I want to print that new message. And we also want to do the opposite, right? So, for example, you want to listen to, the, to some input and say, well, every time the user press enter, I want to send ma this message to everyone so everyone can receive that message. And then when you specify your rules, at the ver very bottom here, you call channel join. So that's the client, okay? And then the server, we're doing two steps. So here we can see that we have two things, right? We have the socket and we have the channel. So in the server, we are going to define the socket. And here's some Elixir code. So uh, we usually break our code inside modules. And so we are saying, hey, I have this user socket that is going to be a Phoenix socket thing. And every time someone is trying to send, uh, to connect to this uh, chat lobby channel, I want to handle that logic in this chat.lob channel module. And every time, um, someone wants to send a message or enter into a room, I want to handle that logic in that other channel. And after we specify the channel, uh, sorry, after we specify the socket, we can implement our channel. So what we're going to do here is that we, it follows the same um, structure as default. Now we are defining another module, which instead of saying use Phoenix socket, is saying use Phoenix, Phoenix channel. And now we define our rules. So for example, we are going to define what is going to happen when the user joins, okay? When the users join the chat lobby, what do we want to do? We want to broadcast, right? We want to tell everyone, hey, this user just joined, right? And then we are going to do that. We say, hey, I want to broadcast on the socket that this user joined, and here's the username. Every time someone sends a message from the client, we want to handle that. So every time the client sends a message, what do we want to do? We want to broadcast that message to everyone as well. And that's what we do on the second function here below. So we have two functions, one that handles the join 
part and the other one that handles all messages that come in. Don't worry a lot about the Elixir code, just uh, if you're not familiar with it, just have an idea of how we are working with those concerns, okay? And that's it. Now when, now with uh, all those uh, short lines of code that we wrote on the client on the server, we have information coming and going between client and server. So uh, I, instead of exploring a lot of the code aspects, I want to take the external view of this and try to understand first how things are going to work uh, from an external perspective, and then how things are going to work internally, and uh, how it, why it matters for us developers, okay? So, um, and there's something else, right? At this point in the talk, when I show those uh, slides, you can see that there is nothing really new, right? We, you probably use, have heard of other solutions in other languages or other frameworks that kind of provide similar abstractions, okay? So you also may be wondering here, what is, what is the big deal with Phoenix then, okay? So let's answer those questions. So, so first thing is that, so when we have the server right here on the right, now we have a browser and we wrote the client code, we wrote the server code, the server code and now we can connect the browser to the server. Uh, so the first difference that we have with Phoenix channels is also that we say that the communication between the client and the server is transport agnostic. So for example, uh, here we are using a browser but if you're using something like a browser, like Internet Explorer, that doesn't support something like web sockets, you need to have another way of communicating with the server. You may have a native mobile application where you have custom needs where, hey, I, can, I don't want to use uh, web sockets here because I have a more efficient protocol for doing this kind of stuff. You can do that as well. Uh, or even embedded devices. When we're talking about embedded devices, sometimes we have uh, particular needs or particular protocols like co-web where you want to have the client communicated to the server. And one of the nice things about this is that, so now we have here a bunch of different clients that could be running different platforms or using different ways to talk to the server. And what is nice about this is that, uh, imagine that at the beginning, okay, let me roll back, okay. Um, imagine that at the beginning here, you only have a single server. Okay, and then you are starting to receive more clients, and we kind of have an idea that this is going to be efficient, right? Because we heard about the WhatsApp case and this kind of stuff, right? That were they, handled to, they were able to handle a bunch of connections. But some, most of the time, you don't want to handle everything on a single server, because if something goes wrong, that server goes down for some unexpected reason, everyone's disconnected. So what you can do with Phoenix, and this works transparently, is that at the moment you add another server, those servers, they're going to start to talk to each other and handle everything for you, you don't need to worry about it. So for example, imagine that that browser disconnects and then uh, because it's, I don't know, going under a bridge or the user has a Wi-Fi problem and then when it comes back, it connects to the other server. Now everything is going to, to work just fine. Every time the browser needs to send a message, okay, it's going to send a message to the first server that's going to tell to the other server that is going to broadcast for everyone, right? And Phoenix handles this really well, and it's going to scale both horizontally, which means as we add more machines, we're going to be able to continue uh, handling the traffic. And it's also going to scale uh, vertically, because we saw in the WhatsApp case, as you know, we get, if we have a powerful machine with 24 cores or 48 cores, as we add more connections to that, the server is going to be able to handle just fine, right? And, and the reason for that is that if you look again, like this case here where you have browsers with a bunch of different devices, is exactly the case you're talking at the beginning of the talk, right? Where you have telephone switches and then you have a different bunch of phones connected. And that's one of the things that is very exciting about Phoenix, right? We are using um, possibly the only platform, the only virtual machine that was designed to handle cases like this, right? That's widely used in production. It was designed for scenarios exactly like that. And Phoenix is leveraging that. Okay, so that's the outside view. So we have an idea of how uh, clients are connected to the server and how we are expecting it to be able to handle um, scalability both on the horizontal and vertical aspects. But things get even more interesting about the inside view. Because, um, I mean, it's great that it scales, but if it's a poor abstraction for us developers and you're going to have a hard time writing code, it's not worth it, right? So we also need to consider this aspect. So let's talk about how things work internally. So when we're writing software that runs uh, in the Erlang virtual machine, so when you're writing Elixir programs, for example, all of your code runs inside processes. 
And from now on to the rest of the talk, every time I say process, I do not mean an operating system process. I mean a very cheap, very lightweight thread of execution. So you have an idea in the WhatsApp case, they had two million connections. So they had at least two million processes, okay? So we can, they are very cheap. We can create a bunch of those. And Phoenix does exactly that. So when the client, which is here on the left, connects to the server, what it's going to do is that it's going to start a process that is going to handle the communication between client and the server, and that's the thing that is responsible for handling the transport agnostic part. Okay? And now, so that's what happens when you call socket.connect. And now every time you join a channel, okay, you're going to create different processes. So uh, chat lobby is going to be one of those processes. Each room that a particular user joins on is going to be another process. And the reason why we do that is because processes give us isolation and concurrency. So this is nice because, for example, imagine that you are, there is a bug in your code and then something goes wrong in the chat lobby room. You don't want for the other functionality on your application to stop working, right? You want that issue to be encapsulated only on that particular channel where, where that happened. When we are talking about embedded devices, for example, sometimes establishing a connection is expensive. So you don't want a bug in a channel or something wrong in a channel to crash the transport. And the process gives us the perfect isolation to write this code. It also gives us concurrency. So imagine that you, for some reason you are processing an image inside one of those channel processes. So someone sent an image into a particular room and then you are doing things inside that channel that's not going to block the other channels. The other channels are going to continue working and the room and the lobby is going to be working just fine. Messages will come and go, okay? So it's really nice because we can, uh, when we are writing code to a particular channel, we really get an isolation and concurrency and it takes a lot of concerns from developers, okay? We just need to think about a particular channel and not how it's interacting with the whole system, okay? And then, so, when we were talking about the code, we had this idea, so we're going to have the transport, right? And then after we connect to the transport, we're going to start a bunch of channels. Each channel uh, runs a separate process that isolated and concurrent. And we also have a third entity here, which is the pub subsystem. And that's what allows us that every time we send a, a message to one particular machine, it goes to all other machines. So the pub sub takes care of that. And by default, it uses distributed Erlang, which is how, um, which, and that's why it's plug and play. As you add Phoenix machines to your cluster, they're going to start talking to each other because Erlang has this idea of distribution built-in. But if you cannot run distributed Erlang or have some concerns, you can bring your own PubSub mechanism too. All right, that was a short introduction to Phoenix and the history behind it. And you can go and you can uh, learn more about Phoenix on the website. And and in a way, I could kind of like stop the talk here right now and you have a good idea about how Phoenix came to be, but it's not representative of what Phoenix is today. Phoenix grew much more beyond the channel aspect. And that was because uh, we on the Phoenix team, we realized that we were in a very unique position. Because in our experience up to this point, all, most of the tooling for the web, they made you choose, right? They have to say, you have two options. Or you can be productive, so we're going to give you this framework that is going to have a bunch of tools and take a bunch of concerns out of your mind, but that's not going to be fast. Or, you're going, or you can use this option here that's very performant, as long as you write things using weird callbacks, using callback styles, or one particular style of programming that does not feel so comfortable. And we realize that with Phoenix, we don't need to make you choose, okay? You can have both. You can have a framework that's going to be performance, that's going to be scalable, and you're going to be productive with it, both in the short term and in the long term, okay? So that's what I want to explore for now for the bulk of the talk. We are going to talk about a little bit about performance, and then we're going to talk about productivity, both short term and long term. So I will start with performance because we were just talking about, uh, you know, scalability and around this area. So let's get this out of the way. So one of the things that you should be curious about is channel's performance. You may be wondering, well, you told me that you know, WhatsApp wrote that thing and it had two million connections on a single machine, but is it true? Does it also apply to Phoenix? We're actually curious about the answer to that question too, so we decided to benchmark. And here are some graphs that we got when we were benchmarking. So <coughs> on the horizontal axis, we have time. So what we were doing is that we set up a cluster of machines. I think at the end we have uh, 40 machines 
sending, uh, opening new connections to a single server. So we were getting new connections at a rate between 10,000 uh, new connections up to 20,000 new connections per second. Okay, so you can see that here. And then um, on the vertical one, you have the accumulated number of clients. And you can see here that as we are pushing load, right, as all those farting machines, farting clients, they're opening connections to the server, we can keep, keep up the pace what, up to when we got to 2 million connections. So when we got 2 million clients, you can see that we continue pushing load, and then the, the server stabilized stabilize at 2,000. And the reason that happens is because when we configure the machine, we configure it to open at most um, 2 million connections. So if we actually said we want to open 5 million connections, it would continue going, which is really nice. And OK, so nice. We're able to get 2 million connections on a single machine. We're able to reproduce that case. And here's how, how the machine looked like, OK? So it's a good machine. It's a machine with uh, 40 cores. I don't remember. I think it was 96 gigabytes of RAM or 120 gigabytes of RAM. And you can see that when we get 2 million clients connected, and there is nothing happening, they're not sending any information, the cores are just waiting right, for something to happen. And then what we did is that we would uh, get Wikipedia articles and broadcast to those 2 million clients, and we could see a spike in I.O., and we could see the Wikipedia article being sent to those 2 million clients in 3 to 5 seconds, which is really amazing. Sweet. And uh, we have good performance, and later in the talk, when I'm going to talk about productivity, I'm going to show exactly how we're able to get to those numbers. It was not magically. We have to do a little bit of work, and I'm going to tell that story soon. Uh, but uh, performance does not only apply to channels, because uh, yes, getting uh, real-time, web real-time, be able to exchange messages between client and server is an important aspect. But the whole uh, static web that we have today, not static, but dynamic web we have today, but we have only request and response, it is still a huge part of our traffic, right? So you may be wondering, if I'm doing regular HTTP and HTTPS requests, is Phoenix going to be um, performant too? And the answer is yes. Wait, let me roll back, because later people will get angry at me. So I'm going to show some benchmarks between uh, different languages and technologies. And I have to start with the disclaimer that don't trust benchmarks, OK? Um, I'm going to post the links of how those exactly things were measured and the repositories we are measuring. Um, but ideally, you want to build a prototype in those things and mention market yourself to make sense that it applies to your use case. That said, I'm sorry, let's see some numbers. So you can see here, um, we have different languages with different technologies. And Phoenix is built on top of something called Plug, which is a very uh, cheap, a very um, a small abstraction around a web server. So you can see that Plug is the fastest uh, for a machine. I think this machine had 10 cores. You can have more information in the URL. Uh, for a machine with 10 cores, we're able to get 200,000 uh, requests per second. And then you can see that Phoenix comes uh, in second, really close to a solution in Go with 180 thousand requests per second. What is really nice about this is that we are going from something that is a very small abstraction around the web server to a web framework, and you are not losing a lot of throughput, okay? only 10%, which means that as you add your own logic, okay, you are not going to be um, affecting performance a lot. And so you can see that at the top of the table, we have solutions in Elixir, Go, and Scala. And then uh, at the bottom of the table, you have uh, solutions coming from Go and Ruby and uh, Node. Okay? And it's also important to highlight in here that from this table, uh, the ones that call themselves actually web frameworks is Phoenix, uh, Play in Scala, and Rails. So, and the reason why I point that out is because they are doing more work for you out of the box. They are uh, worrying themselves about security and these kind of concerns, where the other two, they are more like, hey, you're going to build your own uh, two-chain kind of thing and have to set up a lot yourself. So before we finish the performance section, uh, when we talked about channels, we had that inside view so we could understand how things were working internally and uh, how that would affect the developer. 
Now let's do the same for regular HTTP requests, just to have this idea of how our things are working inside the virtual machine when we are using Phoenix and we're receiving a bunch of requests, okay? So let's take this inside view again. So on the left side, we have the client. On the right side, we have the server. And every time there is a new request, what is going to happen is that we are going to start a new process, which is that very cheap, very lightweight thread of execution. So as we get a bunch of different requests, we are just starting new processes to handle those requests. And as before, those processes, they are isolated and concurrent, OK? And let's see what this means now in the context of regular web requests, OK? So the first thing, as we saw, is that crashes are isolated. We want that, right? If something goes wrong in a request, we don't want it to affect other requests, right? It should be contained to that request. But it also means that data is isolated. And this is really good because it means that we don't have a stop of the word garbage collection. Depending on the platform that we are using to deploy our applications today, you can have a very good response time on average. You're going to look at the average and say, hey, I'm responding in 15 milliseconds. I'm responding in 800 milliseconds. Right? But when you go to the end of the curve, to the ninth percentile, to the 99th percentile, you are starting to see some requests that are taking um, one and a half seconds, two seconds. And those are the unfortunate requests that trigger the garbage collector. So the garbage collector needs to stop everything and clean up. So uh, with Elixir, the data is isolated. So um, the process, they don't share data with each other, which means we don't have a stop the word garbage collectors, uh, garbage collection, which allow us to have an idea of the latency. We say that we have predictable latency. Okay? It's easier to predict how your application is going to behave. And it also means that in some cases, when you have fast requests, we don't even waste CPU cycles doing garbage collection. Because imagine that there is a request, you go, you do everything you need to do, you render that, you send that to the client, right? When it's done, say, hey, the request is done, I generated some garbage here, but you know, there's no need to do garbage collection, just reclaim it back. You don't need to do uh, mark and sweep, mark generations, or things of sort, okay? So that's really nice. And, um, it, and they're also concurrent, which means they're going to load balance on both I.O. and CPU. You don't need to write callbacks or nothing, or nothing of that sort. You just say, if one request uh, needs to talk to another API, you just talk to an API, you can send an external request to a service, and it's not going to block anything else. Okay? You don't need to worry about it. Cool. That was performance. So now let's talk about productivity. Okay? And as I mentioned, I like to break productivity in two parts. So the first one is the short-term productivity, which is you're really excited about Phoenix and you want to try it out, right? So how productive are you going to be? Because um, it's, a new, it's a new framework, right, for those who are not familiar with Phoenix yet. But it's also a new language, and it's also a new uh, runtime. It's a new virtual machine. You have to get acquainted with some of those things. So how will we be able to get something up and running so you can get motivated and continue working on that and continue learning? Okay? But it's also the long-term productivity uh, that we need to talk about, because a lot of the frameworks uh, out there, they only worry about the short-term productivity, right? Which is really fast to get started, but as you add complexity, as you're running that things in production, it starts to really slow you down, okay? So, short-term productivity. So one of the things, how can we help short-term productivity? So one of the things are very good documentation, okay? Uh, very good guides. In Elixir, we have a saying that uh, we like documentation to be first class. I have reserved some time to the end of the talk to do some uh, live coding. Maybe we can explore that. But they say documentation is first class because it should be easy to write and easy to read. So you should be able to access uh, documentation in your terminal, in your browser, in your editor. And uh, the, tool, the tool set really allows you to do that. Okay. Uh, we have uh, guides on the Phoenix sites that's going to allow you to get started. There's a lot also regarding to workflow and generators. We're going to talk about it soon. And there's also the long-term productivity. And here what matters is that if we're running the thing in production, right, we want to talk about introspection. How can I see what my, the code that I put in production, what it's actually doing? How can I see that? How can I understand that? And how can we maintain the code base? Because sometimes we'll be adding features, we'll be um, improving features that we have already deployed. How can we do that? So short-term productivity, so if you go to the Phoenix uh, web page that I've posted earlier, uh, you're going to see that there is a whole section there on the top with guides, documentations, and we have a guide that takes you from installing everything that you need to get started with Phoenix up to deploying it. 
Um, we also have a book that came out. I am one of the authors alongside Chris McCord, which is the creator of Phoenix, and Bruce Tate. We actually have the book in the booth there. So we have a place outside of the, here inside the venue, close where we, we have lunch and eat and talk to each other, where um, they are selling books and programming, programming Phoenix is there. So if you would like to grab a copy and if you'd like to talk about it, I'll be around as well. So books, they also help a lot with the, learn, the getting started experience, right? The short-term productivity. I mentioned workflows and generators. So one of the things that's going to happen is that you're going to start building this application. I'm going to say, hey, what I actually need to do is that I need to build a couple forms, for example, or um, a couple resources where I need to get information from the database, show it to the user, allow the user to change it. So if that's your use case you're worried about, you can run the first command, which is mix phoenix.gen.html. So mix is a build tool that we have in Elixir. And everything you do, you do with mix. So create a new Phoenix application, you do it with mix, compiling your code, testing your code. Okay? And you can also use it to generate, to, to have those workflows that tell you how to build things. So if you're interested in, uh, for example, handling more the HTML side of things, you can run the first command. But if you're interested in building an API, okay, that is going to talk to JSON with different clients, you can run the second command, and then we're going to generate some code, and then I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about how it works, how you should wire everything together. And then if you're interested on the channel aspects I was talking earlier, you just ran this other command for creating channels. Okay, so about short-term productivity, and again, it's like all those things we have seen elsewhere. Right? We have seen other frameworks, other languages that have like that, that have features like that, that allow you to generate some code and get started and get productive early on. And all those things that you have seen in other frameworks, you're going to see those things in Phoenix. Okay? So, um, so I was talking about HTML. One of the things I need to do is to be able to get data from the database, show it to the user, allow the user to change it, and get this data back. So we have form builders that they take care of that. If you're building HTML applications in particular, there is no way to run from this. You need to write some JavaScript, you need to write some CSS, or you need to write something that compiles to JavaScript or compiles to CSS, so Phoenix allows you to take care of that. But we also have some really nice features of our own. So for example, one of the features that comes with Phoenix is live reloading. So if you're working on an application and then you change a CSS file or you change a template, as soon as you save it, uh, we use the Phoenix channels we're talking about to automatically reload the page, and that gives you a very productive workflow. Sometimes, uh, if you're working on something particular where you have a form, you need to click on three places, and then it opens up the model, and you need to customize that model, it's really sweet because you change the CSS file, and you see that change reflected on the page. And if you don't have that, you need to reload the page, do the whole flow on the form again, find out what is wrong. Right? So, a uh, really convenient feature, live reloading. Uh, if something goes wrong, we have really nice uh, debug pages that is going to allow you to see where the error is happening and now you can act on that. Not only that, uh, I love this feature, first class concurrent test tools. So one of the things that we do is that um, we, you, if you're writing an application, we hope you're writing tests. But those tests, sometimes you need to talk to the database. So we have a mechanism where you can actually write tests that talk to the database and those tests, they are running concurrently. Uh, this, a lot of these ideas regarding documentation, like first class documentation, first class concurrency, first class testing, it comes from the Erlen Virtual Machine in Elixir. I like to say that it's 2016, everything you do in your machines today should be using all cores, right? Like last month, Apple announced the Apple Watch 2 and your wrist watch can have two cores, right? So everything we do in our machine, we should be using all the resources available and in Galaxy, you are going to do that, including your tests. Okay, so that matters a lot. And we also have a growing community. We have something called Hex, which is a package manager. And um, if someone has solved the problem, if you are working on a problem and someone has solved it, you can use their packages and integrate as part of your application. So that's short-term productivity. So a lot of the things that you have seen elsewhere, they are just there in Phoenix and a couple other more. So now I want to talk about the other part I mentioned, which is the long-term productivity. And I had separated two, and this part had two sections, okay? So one of the first part of, uh, the first section was about how, so Elixir is a functional programming language, and it was about how, how functional programming can help you write more maintainable applications. 
Uh, but I'm going to skip this part, okay, for now. Uh, we can talk about it at the end of the talk, because I want to focus and do some live coding on the other aspect of long-term productivity, which is something that we call applications, okay? So this is going to be the last section of the talk, and I want to go really deep in this part, because as I promised, since we are in the language track, I want to explore a little bit how everything works inside the language inside the virtual machine. So long-term productivity, applications. So in order to understand what is applications and how we get long-term productivity from this, I want to go back to that inside view we're talking about. Okay, so we have the client here on the left, and then we have the, uh, the server on the right, and then we, we talked about every time the client connects to the server, we get a new process, right? And then we say, actually, you know, multiple clients are connecting at the same time, so we're going to have a bunch of different processes. And you can imagine that for all those processes, we are going to have a process at the top, right? That is kind of like handling those connections for us. One of the things I mentioned for all the talks is that we also had a, pro a process that was responsible <coughs> for PubSub. So every time we send a message to one machine, we somehow need to get that message to all of your clusters so they can broadcast that to the clients that are connected to a particular machine in another part of your cluster. So we have a PubSub process for that too. And now when we start, you know, when we are thinking about our code and we start to think about those processes, which are very cheap, very lightweight, and they are running concurrently and isolated, we start to think like, well, we have all those entities in our code, right? We have like th those connections, we have this pub sub process thing. And you start, to, you start to ask yourself like, wait, but what is going to happen like if those processes, they are uh, independent and isolated, what is going to happen if the PubSub system goes wrong? If the thing responsible to spread the message throughout the cluster, if there's something wrong with that code, and that particular process crash, okay? We start to ask those questions. How is it going to happen in my application if something goes wrong? So our answer to this question is that we define supervisors. And what supervisors allow us to do is that allows us to say, hey, you watch those processes here, and if something goes wrong, so you're going to supervise them. And if something goes wrong, I want you to act on it. So if something goes wrong in the PubSub system, the supervisor is going to, to notice that and start a new PubSub system in its place. And why this idea is important, right? Why, why it's relevant? So, for example, we are, sometimes I'm using, we are using our machines and something starts to go wrong. Like, there is a flicker in the corner of the screen. And they're like, what is happening? And then you go, you restart your machine, and that thing disappears. It never come back again. When you restarted the machine, you fix the problem. And that's exactly the same idea we are applying to this part of code. We are having a supervisor that is going to supervise the PubSub system, because if something goes wrong, it's fine for us to let this PubSub, eaten, PubSub entity crash, because the supervisor is going to start another one to run on its place, okay? And uh, and that's the idea that we start to explore. So we can see that sometimes we have processes that have some parents, which is a supervisor, that has some other supervisor, that has some other supervisor. So this ends up being kind of a supervision tree. And then when we have a supervision tree, we package everything inside an application. Okay, so that's an application. It's when you have a tree of processes there are working on different functions, and then you put everything in a package. So what applications give us at the end of the day? Okay, so they give us a mechanism to package and run our code. So every time you are building a Phoenix uh, application, it's actually this Elixir application where you package everything and has all of your code. And applications can be started and stopped as a unit. And applications also provide the unified configuration. This is nice because if you know how to work on one application and how it is start and how it is started and how to configure that, you know how to find out how all applications are started and how all applications are configured, right? And we also had this idea because when I was showing this slide here, where we have the supervision tree, right? If the application contains all of the processes, right? It has, it has everything that our code is part of, okay? So let's do this. I could go on and on saying about what application is about, about the process state in the supervision tree, but I think I'm going to be able to drive those points home uh, much more strongly if I do an actual demo, okay? So, let's do this. All right. So,
So here can. Perfect. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to, so I've created this Phoenix project before. So I'm going to start it. And what I'm going to do as soon as, it, so here is an interactive Elixir shell with my Phoenix application running. Here I can type any Elixir code I want. But one of the things that I'm going to do here is that I'm going to start this tool called Observer that allow us to see what is happening inside our system. Okay. So after I run that command, it started this beauty here. And Observer gives us an idea, uh, is going to give us all the information we need about uh, this, that particular runtime. So it says, what is the system version that I'm running? Uh, how many cores I have on my machine? For how long it's running? Uh, how many processes it has running right now? And all this kind of information. And also memory usage and where the memories are located and this kind of stuff. Uh, we also have load charts, but I just started this application. Nobody's actually sending requests to it. So nothing interesting is going to happen here. And we have a bunch of other different panes that you could explore the top, at the top. I want to talk about two in particular. So the first one is the process one. Okay? So um, I was saying, like, every time the client connects to the server, we start a new process that's very cheap, very lightweight thread of execution. And, uh, and all of our code, all the code that we write in Elixir, anything that you do in Phoenix, it will always be running inside a process. And in this tab here, the process tab, it lists all of the processes that are uh, running in this particular system. And then everything is listed here. And then I can come and I can uh, double click those and try to understand what each individual of those processes they are doing. And we can do a lot of wonderful things with this. So if you can see here at the top, one of the things that we have, for example, is how much memory each process is consuming. So, for example, imagine you're working on this application and there is a memory leak. Like, wait, memory is growing, there's something wrong happening. One of the ways you can do to solve this memory leak is to open up Observer, order here by memory consumption, okay, and see which process is growing memory. It keeps on continuing growing memory. It's probably going to be at the top by the part you come to investigate it. And then you can come. You can double click that process and say, hey, let me see what this process is doing, exactly which part of the code it's running, what is its state, and so on. Okay? So, uh, wonderful. Remember, I was also telling about uh, Phoenix that were able to reproduce the WhatsApp case where it got two million connections on a single machine? The truth is, when we started benchmarking it, the first benchmark that we ran when we set up the machines for, them, for all those clients to connect to the server, we were able to handle only uh, 30,000 clients, okay? And then we say, oh, it's, we, we cannot push more load, there's something wrong. You know how we solve that problem? We open up Observer, we connect to the, to, to the remote machine, we open up Observer, and then we came here, and what we did is that we ordered by this message queue column, okay? So what this message queue column says is that every time a process needs to talk to each other, they send messages. And if a process cannot act fast on those messages, this message queue starts to grow. And that's what we did. We came here, we ordered by message queue, and we could see that there was a process that a lot of people were trying, a lot of other processes were trying to talk to, but it could not keep up. It was a bottleneck. It was literally a bottleneck. So I say, hey, I know where the problem is. We went there, we removed the bottleneck, and then we were able to get more clients. And then we benchmarked again, we found the next bottleneck, exactly the same way, and we're able to get more clients. We did this um, one or two more times, and then, we're, and then we're able to get to two million connections, okay? Because all the code is running inside those processes, and we have a bunch of introspection about what we can do here. Uh, so the process tab is really, really nice, but my favorite is the applications tab, and we're just talking about applications, okay? So remember, the idea behind application is that we can package our code and all of the processes Okay, and they are contained. And when we run an application in, in the VM, we don't have only one application running. We have many applications running side by side. One way to think about them is to think about them as components. Okay, so here you can see all those applications that are running when we start Phoenix. So we have Cowboy, which is the name of the web server, and then we have things uh, such as Elixir. Elixir itself is an application. Uh, Phoenix itself is another application, and so on. And you can see here, supervision trees, right? Each of those applications, they have their supervision trees. Um, and you could go and explore them if you wanted to. But the one I want to talk about is the, the, the supervision tree that is part of your application itself. 
And this application is called demo, and here we can see the supervision tree. So everything that is happening in your application, you can come and navigate through this tree. So one of the things that we can do here is, so if you have a web application, one of the things that you are likely doing in this application is talking to a database. And, and the way that the majority of languages talk to the database is that they have a connection pool. So when your application starts, they open up like 10 connections against the database, and every time you want to run a query or write something, you get a connection from the pool and you write to that connection. And we can see that here in our supervision tree. So um, this is what we have. So here we have the connection pool to the database, to so our repository. And you can see here all of the connections to the database. Okay? They are all represented by those processes here. So uh, this number, uh, those numbers between the, the signs, they are the process identifier. There, there is a number that identifies the process. So now that we can see those things here, we can try to reason what's going to happen when things go wrong, because that was one of the reasons why we added supervisors and we started talking about supervision trees, because we have all of those processes and we want to try to understand what is going to happen when something goes wrong in our system, when something goes wrong with the pub sub process, or when something goes wrong when talking to the database. So what we can do here is like, imagine that in one of those processes that is talking to the database, imagine that something goes wrong and uh, the database shuts down, the, shut, shuts down the connection, for example, or something else happens. We can actually double click the process and say, I want to kill this process. And then we send a kill message. So because we're talking about supervisors, what we're expecting to happen here, we're expecting for a supervisor to notice that one of the database connection is no longer there Okay, it's going to notice that and start another one in its place. And we can see this, that's exactly what happened. Now here at the top, we have a new process with a new identifier because that one is dead. We can actually be even more radical and say, hey, what if there is a bug in our connection pool? Okay, what if, what if th there is something wrong in the connection pool and th that whole process responsible for handling those connections fail? We can come here, we can double click and say, okay, I want to shut down this process and see if my system can react to that failure, if my system can self-heal. And we can see that's exactly what happens here. Okay, so I have my pool, and now, and now because that pool is over, all the connections are terminated, which is good, we don't have lingering connections, right? All the connections are terminated, and we start a new connections to the database. Okay. So, going back to the talk, So instead of going through, uh, we so kind of see everything that an application can do, right? It packages our code and it has a supervision tree that allows it to explore. But at the end of the day, right, that doesn't matter much for us, right? What we want to do is, is we want to know which guarantees we get from that. And the guarantees that we get is that we have a lot of introspection and monitoring, right? If our system is running production, you can actually plug into that and understand everything that our system is doing. From Observer, we had an idea of all of the metrics that we can actually get from the virtual machine, right? So if you want, you can get those metrics and push them to an external system where you can uh, follow those metrics and see how, what is the rate of process failures and all the uh, all important information you need to know. How is the pressure that I have in your system? How is the memory being allocated? You don't need to rely on the observer. The observer is only using information that is, is in the VM and you can use that to export to any system you want to. It gives us visibility of the whole application state. As we saw, we could go in the tree and we could double click things and interact with those things. It is also really easy to break into components and that's something we explore in the book. Imagine that you're working on, on your Phoenix project and then you're starting adding more processes to the tree, right? And then at some point you say, well, this thing is doing too much, okay? We, we need to break it apart. One of the ways to break it apart is to print the supervision tree we were just seeing and say, hey, what is going to happen if I get this part of the tree and move it elsewhere. So you can get a, a branch, for example, and move it elsewhere. You can get a subtree and move it elsewhere and break your application apart. And it also gives us the reasoning when things go wrong. So to sum up, um, this is a talk about Phoenix, and I tried to do a mix, and not only talk about Phoenix. So Phoenix is a web framework that is going to be productive, reliable, and fast, and um, it comes with this um, way of having the channels where it can have multiple connections between client and server and have information coming and going all the time. But not only that, it's on parity with whatever we have used so far for doing web in terms of uh, building APIs, 
uh, building uh, HTML applications. And in some aspects, we are even better because we can integrate uh, new features with Phoenix channels. So uh, that's one uh, aspect of the talk, right? How we can use Phoenix uh, both for the new web, which is this highly connected aspect with channels, but also for, let's say, the traditional web that is being here uh, for a while. And I also try to explore the foundation, the, be the battle-proven technology that Phoenix is built on top and how it's leveraging really the foundation that is there for three decades that was built with the Erling Virtual Machine and then built on top by Elixir. So if you want to learn more about Phoenix, you can visit the page, click that huge button. You can also uh, try the Phoenix book. As I said, they are selling it in the booth there, so if you want to grab your copy now, um, please do it. And if you want to chat about it, just ping me, I'll be around. If you want to learn more about those other aspects I explored, about applications, supervisors, or about Elixir in general, you can also go to the Elixir website, elixir-lang.org. Uh, that we have guides that is going to allow you to explore the language, not only the foundational aspects, but the, most, the more advanced aspects too. We have two guides in particular, one which is the getting started per se, and the other one which is uh, called Mix and OTP that's going to explore about actually building an application, a distributed application. And we also have plenty of books for Elixir. If you go to, go to the website, there is also a learning section in the menu where we have books, screencasts, and different materials for you to learn. There is also uh, an initiative called Elixir School that teaches Elixir in a bunch of different languages. I don't know if they have a translation to Danish yet, but if not, someone could get started on that, and that would be wonderful. And finally, I want to thank my company, Terraform Attack. We are the ones uh, who built and designed Elixir, and we are also contributing actively to Phoenix. So if you are interested in starting with Elixir uh, and have some coaching, or if you're already running, you're already building your Phoenix application, and you have some kind of, and you need kind of design review or architecture review, uh, just let us know, just get in touch, okay? And that's it, that's a talk about Phoenix, thank you. Do we have questions? I forgot to say that you can send questions throughout the talk. That was my bad. But uh, yeah, so so how does Phoenix compare to other real-time web frameworks that use it purely JavaScript? An example could be uh, Meteor. So that's a very wide question, right? Like how we compare on each aspect. So. If you are thinking about in terms of um, performance, we are going to get much better performance uh, with Phoenix. But if you are trying to wor if you're worried about uh, some concepts between, so for example, one of the features of Meteor, Meteor is the sharing between a client and the server, and that's something that you're not going to get with Phoenix, for example. But we can uh, we have other positive trade-offs uh, in other areas, such as. Uh, having more flexibility, so Meteor, it's kind of like, hey, you need to use, I don't know if they allow you to use something other than Mongo at this point, but they are more rigid in terms, like, if I don't want to do this default kind of way, right, you don't have a lot of, a lot of options in Meteor, while well, Phoenix gives you more flexibility in this aspect. So, yeah. So, and, oh, this is a good question. What happens if the supervisor crashes, right? It's the famous, uh, what supervises the supervisors. So um, usually we have a supervision tree, right, which means that sometimes the supervisor, they have supervisors themselves, okay? And then, but you can think like, well, at this point, I'm going to go to the top of the tree, and then something, what, we, what if that thing fails? So there are two things that is going to, to happen here. So the first one is that the supervisor code, it has been running in production for like two decades, and it's like, they are really conservative with changes to the supervisor code. So the supervisor, by default, is supposed to be very, very reliable, right? Uh, I think uh, about, so you have an idea, about uh, 50 or 55% of the whole 3G traffic in Europe go through Erlang switches. So, you know, there's this part of the code that's really well tested. And the thing is that if you put the supervision tree, okay, uh, inside your application, we have this thing called an application controller, which is the one that is restarts the supervision tree that is also very battle tested and it has been running a lot. So, uh, so the idea is that there is some code right there that it should not fail, right? Um, and it has been really tested to not fail and you rely on that. 
I did the example with the machine, right? Like, you know, when, when something goes wrong, we start our machine and uh, it goes back to work. Sometimes the problem never comes back. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, whoever is building our machine, they really test the boot instructions because if the boot, the boot instructions, if they are wrong, then it's game over, right? There's nothing you can do. So it's a similar concept uh, being applied here. Um, so, oh, so this question is more specific to someone who is already using Phoenix. Uh, so what is coming in next version of Phoenix? Any plans to build authentication to the framework? Um, so that's a good question. So there is something that I didn't talk, uh, I didn't mention here, but the latest Phoenix release, which is quite recent, it was in June now, uh, which was Phoenix 1.2, we introduced Phoenix Presence. And Phoenix Presence is a way for you to know, for example, if you have a room, or if you have a channel, or a game channel, whatever, who is connected to that channel. And Phoenix Press is really nice because we are using the whole distribution we are talking about. So if someone joins on this machine, we spread that information so everyone in the other machines can know that you joined. So you can track who is present on each channel. And it works completely decentralized, just exchange information between machines. You don't need to rely on the database. You don't need to rely on Reddit, uh, on, Reddit on, on Redis and things like that. Um, so that's something that we just launched, and what we are planning for Phoenix 1.3 is, so there is one thing that we inherited from other frameworks like Rails, and I'll try to show this very quickly. I have three minutes. Which is, if you go to, if you go to your Phoenix application today, I'm going to increase the code. You can see here, there is this web directory at the, here, very on the left side, okay, we have the directory structure. And then we have a uh, something called models, which is every time we need to have something that interacts to the database, like, hey, I want to get, like, I have a user, and I want to get the first name, the last name, and the user age from the database into this thing. So we have this thing called models. And the things that we have in models, they, today, the way they work is that they kind of map directly to having a database, but that's a very bad idea. And why is that? Because imagine that you are you just hired to, uh, for example, to a new company and you are going to work on their application. When you open the web model directory, you're, you're going to see all the, all the files that you're going to have there. You're going to see them, you're going to see the structures that are supposed to map to the database. And that doesn't tell you anything about what that application does. The only thing that it's actually telling you is that you're going to have those things in the database and how they map to the database. Like, it gives an idea of your database structure. But if I wanted to know my database structure, I would go and check the database. I wouldn't go to my application. So one of the things that we are doing is to, uh, we're, we're, we want to push developers to think more about context. Right? You don't, ah, and there's some other problem, big problem with this, which is who here already worked on an application where we would have like models or whatever you call models that had like 50 fields, 100 fields? Can someone identify with that? All right, right? And why is that? It's because we don't think about context here, right? We just have this user thing, and then like, oh, I guess this is related to the user. You're trying to shove everything into one place. So I wanted to do this to think about context. You don't have a user on its own. The user, it, which part of application does it relate to? Is it about the account system? Is it about the authentication system? So you want to, you to think about those contexts and break things into context. So when you're coming to your application, you can say, hey, this thing is about uh, accounts, this is about purchases, this is about payments, right? And sometimes different contexts, you're going to have user, it's going to be spread out in different contexts, right? Because the user that is thinking about uh, authentication, the columns that are about authentication, they should be in the authentication part or in the authorization part. Everything that's related about user payment should be elsewhere. It should not be everything coupled into one place. So uh, those are um, features that we are exploring for Phoenix 1.3, and the good news is that those changes, they'll mostly be done to the generators. So if you start using Phoenix today, it's not, oh, your code is going to break by the next version. No, it's just that when we are talking about generators, because as we said, they are learning tools, we want to push people towards the proper direction so they can reason better about their application. 
All right, uh, we, I won't have, we had a bunch of other questions, but I cannot answer all of them, so I'll be around, just come asking questions. Also, if you want stickers, I don't have Phoenix stickers, but I have Elixir stickers if you want to, so come around, come talk. I'll be glad to answer anything. Thank you. Thank you.